Thank you for tuning in to watch this first recorded webinar in conjunction with the Southwest Fraud Forum and Synologic Innovative Solutions Limited. Um, we are going to hear over the course of our debate from three leading academics, um, Professor Nicholas Ryder, Dr Fiona Brimblecombe and Dr Samantha Borton, in conjunction with Chris Nelson, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire and Alex Chalk, QC, MP and former Solicitor General. Um, we'll be debating when data can be shared between government agencies and law enforcement agencies uh, and what improvements we could see over the course of the next few years uh, for greater cohesion between those departments and teams. I really hope you enjoy what we've discussed and please do feed back to us any information you have that might be of relevance to future webinars that we'll be recording. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. Um, very much an informal chat. Um, we've got a variety of esteemed guests here, and um, I just wondered if it would be uh, appropriate for us to work our way around a little bit and introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Dan White. I'm Chief Commercial Officer at Synologic and a practicing barrister, uh, and I've uh, been responsible for coordinating th this gathering so we can get greater attention to the white paper that's been produced by a number of the leading academics who are present with us. So um, I wonder if we could work our way around the room, perhaps, uh, Alex? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Alex Chalker. I'm the Member of Parliament for Cheltenham. Uh, my background is uh, also as a barrister, uh, prosecuting and defending in everything from fraud to homicide to terrorism. Um, more recently, I've been the Prisons Minister and the Solicitor General uh, which of course superintends the Crown Prosecution Service and the Serious Fraud Office. I'm now no longer the Solicitor General, I should make that clear. <laughs> and uh, Chris Nelson, Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire, obviously looking at this from law and order point of view. I'm uh, Professor Nick Ryder from Cardiff University and have been uh, researching financial crime for about 15 years. I'm uh, Dr Sam Borton and I'm a lecturer in law at the University of the West of England and my research focuses on the law relating to tax evasion. And my name's uh, Dr Fiona Brimblecombe, I'm an academic at Manchester University and I write on privacy on the internet, the GDPR and defamation. Thank you. Well, um, we're here to talk about a paper that's been put together by uh, the three of you, um, which, which started from a conversation between myself and Nick. And, um, I wonder perhaps whether we should give a bit of a background to all of that. Um, from a Synologic perspective, we've been working with government agencies for the last four years, um, law enforcement agencies, police forces, government agencies, and time and time again, we're hearing from those organisations that they don't have sufficient clarity in terms of when they can share important information about their investigations, civil inquiries, criminal inquiries, whether it's information that should be shared from the private sector or with the private sector, and they wanted clarity around that. And the laws are there, the permissions were there from my perspective. And so I wanted to try and gain greater clarity around that and, and bring a bit of awareness to what is permissible from what I consider to be the leading academics in this area. Um, and, and, and that's what triggered me to get involved in um, today. Um, so I hope with that in mind, um, we can move on to discussing the, the reasons behind some of the detail. And um, I wonder whether, uh, Alex, if I hand over to you really to, to touch upon that. Yeah, well, I mean, you've prepared this, between you, you've prepared this article, which um, I've had a chance to read. It's all quite um, uh, technical and involved. And I thought what might be helpful, if you agree, is just to pick up some of the points um, within your particular areas of expertise. So, I mean, I, I wonder whether perhaps um, Fiona, do you want to kick off with talking about the privacy elements? Yes. Um, so there was a quote that you picked out, Dan, that I thought was really interesting in the agenda that you circulated round about what degree do I think that there's sort of clarity actually in the law here around what sort of data is, personal data, I should say, it is permissible to share sort of in these contexts between private bodies and law enforcement agencies and between law enforcement agencies themselves. And it was my sort of impression doing the research I did for this paper, that first of all, you know, the state of affairs as it is, the laws are convoluted. Um, there's no way around that. And there is a couple of reasons why. So there's different levels of legality here. So we've got, on the one hand, the UK GDPR having some level of effect, which is obviously sort of supranational as, you know, initially envisaged as a regulation that's been absorbed into the English legal system. And then you've got the Data Protection Act 2018, which is English law on the ground, and they interact with one another. There's a lot of cross-referencing there sort of at play. And it actually makes 
um, working out what can and cannot be shared, very difficult, especially from sort of a lay person's point of view. Um, and there is definitely a lack of legal certainty around the circumstances where you can share personal data. Obviously, there's a number of sort of crime and taxation, etc., exemptions in the Data Prote Protection Act 2018, which is useful and important. And my reflection sort of at the end of what I wrote is that it, what you said earlier, Dan, it's absolutely possible to law lawfully share personal data in these contexts of, sort of law enforcement. If you bear in mind sort of three key principles that I mentioned in the briefing paper. So this idea of proportionality, you know, are you sharing what needs to be shared? You know, are you sharing too much? Okay, just enough. This idea of, that really came across was justifications. So you have to have a very clear idea of why you're sharing that information. And you have to log it as you go along. So, you know, lest sort of it comes back and questions are asked later on. But without wanting to sort of go on too much, I think if I was to really say honestly, is this an easy area to generate legal certainty? The answer is no. And because it's easy to criticise the current data protection regime, but it's much harder to put it right. Um, the reason is there's so many factors at play. The reason why sort of the GDPR and to, I think, to an extent the Data Protection Act 2018 is written in sort of, in some cases, in open-ended terms, for example, not defining what we mean by the public interest, is that it gives judges a scope to interpret hard cases, unusual facts. It also gives us the flexibility to interpret the law as appropriate when new technology is developed, because obviously data protection law is always limping one step behind technology you know which is i think kind of inevitable because law takes so long to be passed um so i would sound a word of caution of trying to too readily change the law without sort of due consultation and drafting taking place because this is such a complex area but there are definitely lots of uh, grey parts. Yeah, it. can I just ask about that before mm -hmm. we move on to the others? Mm -hmm. Because I've seen that uh, complexity and that lack of um, clarity, if you like, even if it's necessary for the reasons you indicate, but I've seen how that impacts the real world. So uh, when I was Solicitor General, we were looking at something called the Attorney General's Guidelines on Disclosure. And what they, they, they do all sorts of things in the context of a criminal trial, but one quite important aspect is we were trying to deal with the transfer of information from the police to the CPS. So imagine the scene. The police attend a report of a crime, an allegation of domestic abuse. Uh, they, they walk in, they've got their body-worn cameras on, they go into one of the uh, bedrooms uh, because they're there, they're trying to speak to the complainant about the case and indeed she gives her first account, she's cowering, there's blood on her face, she says this is what happened. As they're walking around the room, that camera sees, for example, a, uh, a medical prescription or it sees an open page of a, a passport uh, and so on. And so the issue then arises before the, the police can provide that file to the CPS, by the way, a file which might end up with the CPS saying, we're not gonna charge this for whatever reason, to what extent does redaction need to take place at great time and expense and inconvenience to police officers, and by the way, demoralizes them in the event that they don't end up charging this stuff. And they had to consider all these issues about necessity and so on. So what we ended up doing is creating examples to the police. In these circumstances, you don't have to redact. In these, you do. But it's trying to plot a way through the thicket of all these sometimes competing uh, legislative provisions. So uh, just before I move on, what, what do you think needs to change? Or is your argument, no, no, leave, as it is, leave it as it is. Because, as you say, technology is moving on. This inevitably has to be dealt with as a case-by-case -case basis. Or do you think that there is a role for the law to provide more clarity on these topics? There's definitely a you know, place to be had for more clarity. I think more informal guidance needs to take place. The examples that you've given yeah. of actually case studies and saying in this scenario... And who would provide that guidance? Well, I wonder... If the ICO is brilliant, first of all, because when I was writing my part of this briefing paper, the guidance they gave was by far... Um, well, it was excellent. And the College of Policing also gave some excellent guidance as well. Um, but I think it needs to come from parliamentary, possibly or governmental level guidance, or more from the ICO, because what I saw was fantastic. On that point, before we move on, finally, do you think that uh, some people are unnecessarily scared of the ICO? The reason why I say that is because there's, we pick up anecdotally, totally unscientific, mind you, uh, 
anecdotally people saying, oh dear, we better not do that because the ICO will come after us. And in fact, the ICO going, we, we, we want to facilitate the sensible exchange of information. We're not there to step in with our size 12s at every opportunity and start fining people or dragging people through the courts, etc. So, so do, do you think there's a bit of a disconnect between perception and reality when it comes to the ICO? Completely, and data protection law in general. I think private companies and to a lesser extent maybe law enforcement bodies, they are, you know, data protection sort of a dirty phrase. I think people are sort of unnecessary or government, um, government bodies and, you know, private bodies unnecessarily scared of this, this legislation. It's we've got to step back and remember why we're talking about this. You know, the GDPR and the DPA, they're there for a very good reason. They were drafted over a number of years to protect individual rights, personality interests. You know, the GDPR was a global standard setter. Um, and it was far better than what we had before, the old directive and the old Data Protection Act. So, yes, I think you're completely right. I think the ICO performs a fantastic and um, actually very, they're very reasonable in their, um, how they conduct their affairs. So I think they are... I, I said that some scared. people are possibly a little bit scared seeing ghosts sometimes. So let's move on to Dr Sam Borden. Sam, do you want to talk to your a part of the paper. Just give us the highlights, if that's all right. Absolutely. So um, Nick and I put together several case studies which in our view, really illustrate some of the deficiencies in the exchange of information at present, and perhaps some of the misunderstandings of, of legislation that have perhaps been alluded to in the discussion this morning. Um, so we drafted four case studies, and um, in the next part, we also considered the legislation that governs the exchange of information between law enforcement authorities. So there we were looking really at the statutory gateways that allow one enforcement agency to exchange information with another. So given that my research um, predominantly focuses on tax evasion and money laundering, uh, the first case study that I was examining uh, looked at the response to the HSBC Swiss scandal. So this is where it was revealed that HSBC Swiss had assisted clients from all over the world to evade taxation, including over a thousand clients from the UK. And at the time, there were quite serious questions as to why no action was taken against the bank itself. HSBC being a UK headquartered bank. Um, and in particular, it was questioned why um, fraud or money laundering charges weren't brought against the bank. And through parliamentary inquiries at the time, it was revealed that HMRC actually did not share um, the information that they had with the Financial Conduct Authority or the Serious Fraud Office, the National Crime Agency or others. And at the same time, it maintained the position that because we were talking about money laundering rather than a tax offence, that it itself did not have action um, or did not have power to take action in that area. So <laughs> the question then arises, why was that information not exchanged? And in this um, particular instance, it was because of the treaty between France um, and the UK. Um, and the provision in that treaty, which stated that information um, that has gone from France to the UK, to HMRC, can only be exchanged with other law enforcement authorities when um, it's used for addressing a criminal offence that France would have similar to the UK, and when the French authorities gave permission for the data to be shared in that way. Now, there's some uncertainty around the facts. Um, HMRC claims that they did not get permission, whereas France's then finance minister claims that they did give HMRC the permission to share the information. Um, but regardless, the Financial Conduct Authority was only given the information after it was released to the media. Um, and so for me, that um, entire sort of case study example demonstrates that there are issues when it comes to the exchange of information between law enforcement authorities. Well, this is about reporting to law enforcement authorities, isn't it, in the first instance? Um, so here, this would be in terms of the exchange between them, because um, France had shared that information with HM Revenue and Customs, mm -hmm. and they essentially then kept it to themselves. So they did investigations on all the um, alleged tax crimes, 
But um, because there are allegations of money laundering rather right. than tax fraud, they didn't investigate the bank itself. And they also didn't share that information with the authorities. Right, and did. so just so I understand, what, what was it uh, uh, that led them to be reticent? Is it because they thought that the French hadn't given permission? The French said, we have given permission. OK, all right, Absolutely. so if that's, if that's the issue, isn't that just a classic breakdown in communications? Or is there actually a wider uh, public policy uh, piece here? I think if it was the one example, we could perhaps put it down to perhaps, you know, that particular yeah. situation. Um, but actually through our research, Nick and I have found several examples where HMRC appear to be very reluctant to share information with right. other and what, law enforcement. Okay, and we'll come to Nick in a sec, but what yeah. underpins that reluctance? Is it again a, uh, a sort of a fear of that the ICO are going to come barging in and say that you've breached <coughs> the law? Or is it a cultural reluctance? Is it people operating in silos? What's your diagnosis? Um, I would in a way say all of the above. So we alluded to the fact earlier that there's often the legal framework to share this information, but actually it's often the interpretation of it um, or misunderstandings of that legislation that prevent the information okay, and what's sharing. the what's the single biggest misunderstanding in your view? So um, I think when it comes to HM Revenue and Customs, um, we have to look at the Commissioners for Revenue and Customs Act which um, imposes a obligation of confidentiality on HMRC in terms of the information that they collect from taxpayers. And there's a criminal offence within that piece of legislation which is imposed on HMRC employees who reveal information in circumstances that they shouldn't. Um, and so there is a very strong obligation of confidentiality. That being said, the Act permits HMRC to disclose information in certain circumstances. Uh, one of those circumstances is that there is a legal gateway that allows that disclosure. Um, and there are several legal gateways uh, which provide for information sharing with other law enforcement authorities. There are also exceptions relating to the public interest, which again is likely to cover things like criminal investigation. Okay, exactly. Can I just stop you there? Because one of those gateways has got to be, and you've just touched on it there, if there's suspicion of, that a criminal offence yeah. has been committed, that I would have thought is relatively straightforward. So supposing they uh, see a load of um, evasion which spills over into some sort of fraud, yeah. then should it should be barn door, op uh, very obvious. So why, why do you think that there is still a reluctance, if indeed there is a reluctance, to share with, for example, the Serious Fraud Office or the National Crime Agency? Why does that uh, resonance that exists? So you would hope that information would be shared. And I think, in my view, one of the issues with uh, the Commissioners for Revenue and Customs Act is that it says information can be shared in these circumstances, not necessarily that it should be shared in those circumstances. And just before, before you go on, yeah. like, if I had HMRC in this room now, yeah. Would they accept the premise of your challenge? In other words, that they sit on stuff, would they say, what are you talking about? No, no, of course we send it. We send it every time. Every time we have a reasonable suspicion, we send it through. Now, if NCA don't do anything about it, that's a matter for them, but we do everything right. Or would they accept that they're probably a bit reluctant? Um, I think that there would be some pushback. Um, I think they would agree with my interpretation of the legislation. HMRC officials themselves have said in the past, it provides us with a power rather than an obligation to share information. And they would confirm that they hold the control, if you like, as to whether that information should be shared. Um, however, in fairness to HMRC, it's probably not that they, in many circumstances, don't want to share that information, but there's a lot of other pressures that are probably bearing down here. Um, one is obviously time and resources. I think there's been um, a lot of talk over the last few years about how well financed HMRC is. Um, the other is that culture of confidentiality. So I mentioned that there's a criminal offence if employees share information. Um, it was intended when HMRC was created that there would be this very strong culture of confidentiality in order to prevent taxpayer information being leaked um, in inappropriate ways. And so we've almost got a piece of legislation that says you can disclose it, but you don't have to combined with a culture that says you probably shouldn't exchange that information and then a context where there's a huge lack of resources, a lack of time to actually make that a priority as well.
Um, so in my personal view, an easy way to sort of remedy some of this would perhaps be to make that um, information exchange compulsory in certain circumstances. For instance, in my view, um, if HMRC uncovers or has a suspicion that serious organised crime or terrorism has taken place, for me, I don't see why that obligation couldn't be mandatory, um, that, that in that circumstance, that yeah. information has to be disclosed. OK, and I'd, I'd like to ask you in a moment about whether some of that could be automated in a way to take out some of the uh, some of the, the grit in the machine, if you like. Uh, come on to uh, Professor Ryder now, Nick. Um, do you agree with all that? And if so, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, as part of the paper, the, the other case studies that we've touched upon to illustrate that it's not simply um, limited to tax evasion and tax fraud is that um, one of the first case studies we looked at was the use of money laundering and the use of suspicious activity reports. Mm. And, uh, you know, the, the, the SAR system, if I can call it that, is, is problematic. It's far from perfect. Um, a lot of it will depend on how you define suspicion, which the case law is very inconsistent. Um, there are guidelines provided by um, relevant professional associations. But, you know, one prime example that we found was the, the conviction of NatWest Bank last year where, with regards to the first corporate conviction by the Financial Conduct Authority for not complying with the 2007 money laundering regulations. And the amount of money laundered in this particular bank was over £364 million. Pounds. I mean, you know, you were talking a Hollywoodized example of people walking into the bank with carrier bags full of cash that were deemed to be suspicious by some members of the team in that West, but not one suspicious activity report was submitted to the National Crime Agency. So clearly there are problems within the internal operations of, of and it isn't just NatWest, other banks. And, and what was the comeback on NatWest for that? Because that uh, sounds like a, like a fairly flagrant example. Yeah, uh, the, the fine was £264.1 million, pounds, and that was last December. Yeah. And that is the only bank in the UK to be taken to court and prosecuted. Uh, normally it's a financial penalty by the financial And your argument authority. is what, that this is the tip of the iceberg and there's a whole load of stuff going on where there's inconsistent SAR reports. Yeah, the SARS regime is fundamentally flawed and you tend to find that there, there is a concept called defensive reporting where there are 55,000 reporting entities in the UK who law firms, bank, financial advisors have to comply with the SARS regime. And they will submit a suspicious activity report, not because they feel it's suspicious, but even if they don't submit the report, they're going to get given a significant penalty by the Financial Conduct Authority. So, But, but if that's right, how does that explain the fact that there appears to have been a reluctance on NatWest to actually file the report, which led to them having a very expensive mm -hmm. payout? Mm -hmm. Uh, but you say, on the other hand, there is defensive, where people are almost automatic. So is it just the case that some are doing it too readily, some are not doing it enough, and that it's just not working as it should? What's your diagnosis? Uh, I think, based upon the research, it's, it's all of the above. If I can use what, what Sam said earlier, you know, the system is fundamentally flawed. The, there is an argument that the NCA needs more staff in terms of looking at the financial intelligence. But what, what we've tended to find is that, in addition to the SARS regime, there are other aspects of financial crime where there are no reporting. So, for example, fraud. Uh, one of the, the, the case studies in terms of terrorism financing links into the uh, London Borough Market attack in 2017 and, and one of the terrorists, Karine Butt, who, and to find this evidence, you've really got to dig into the, 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 the coroner's inquiry report into how the attack was financed. So Karine Butt claimed, had three bank accounts, uh, Santander, Nationwide and um, Lloyd's TSB. And the allegations were that Karen Butt had defrauded his Santander account by multiple cash withdrawals. Mm. So he had informed his bank, look, someone's cloning my card, they've taken the money out of the account. So Santander investigated it and then think, well, actually, we feel that Karen Butt might be committing the fraud. So a year before the attack, a case goes to the Crown Prosecution Service and for reasons uh, which are redacted in the official inquiry into the report, the, it appears there was insufficient evidence. But Santander are under no legal obligation to report that suspected fraud to anybody. There's a loophole. So money laundering, terrorism, financing, there's an obligation to report. But for fraud, it goes to action fraud. And of course, we've seen in the last couple of years with the, the expose by the Times in 2019 and the subsequent Mackay report that sadly action fraud, despite the, the, the merits of its philosophy, is not fit for purpose. So one of the things that we questioned in, in the briefing paper and subsequent research is, you know, should there be mandatory reporting for suspected fraud? So just, just trying to pull the threads together, I think you're saying that 
where there are areas where there is a discretion whether to report, sometimes that discretion is being operated in a somewhat haphazard way. So some people are being too ready to report in a defensive way. Others are being too reluctant to report the, the, the NatWest example. Mm. But there's a whole other area, which is fraud, where because there is no uh, obligation, it's just being missed broadly. Is that, is that have I understood it correctly? Spot on, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, the, the threat presented by fraud is that according to the most recent crime survey, you know, fraud is 40% of all reported yeah. crime. And of that, 54% is cyber enabled. Mm. So, you know, fraud is, you know, we can argue, yes, it, you know, some people argue it's a victimless crime. That's no longer relevant in 2022. But fraud is a national security threat. I mean, as part of the project with working with Synologic, we've identified um, an emerging um, fraud typology. And fraud is one of the most frequently used mechanisms yeah. to fund acts of terrorism because it's low cost, it's ineffective, yeah. and it might be not on the on the police force's radar because it might be a, a thirty pound fraud. Well, I'm going to come to uh, police and crime commission in a moment, but just tell tell me this because uh, well, we're both barristers, we've had experience of uh, prosecuting cases, and it's all about the investigation, it's all about pulling the, the material together. So, from your point of view, to, to what extent is it possible for the likes of NatWest or other providers to be able to pull this material together, metaphorically speaking, put a pink ribbon around it and pass it to the investigators, say, look, this is the situation. This is where the money has gone from and to. This is why it's uh, suspicious. Here, by the way, is potentially a witness statement or, or, or uh, somebody who will, uh, in effect, put their name uh, to that movement of, of money. It's there. All you need to do, a little more than that, possibly, <laughs> but all you basically need to do is go and find this guy get him uh, into a police station and interview him under caution. So it can, is that something that can be done by the, by the banks and other authorities? It, it's forth? something that can be done. So the, um, one of the most recent developments in, in, and the UK is regarded as a benchmark in, in terms of international standards, is the exchange of information between the private sector and the public sector. So when Theresa May was Home Secretary, one of the initiatives was to set up the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, or GIMLET, which allows the facilitation of the private sector to exchange with the public sector. So the Criminal Finances Act actually allows Bank A to exchange information with Bank B without being uh, called to believe GDPR or data protection issues. Now, the extent to that happens, I honestly don't know um, because the information obviously wouldn't be publicly available, but the mechanisms do exist whereby the reporting entities, the banks or law firms, are in a better position to submit what's called a super suspicious activity report that contains more information that can be drawn from credit card providers or financial institution A, financial institution B, or maybe information from open source data, for example. So it does exist, but I don't know specifically. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to Chris, because I mean, the, the, the point is that any law enforcement authority anywhere in the world will have limited resource. That's, that's a fact. And this stuff is complicated, and it will only ever be successfully prosecuted in the event that there is a partnership between the private sector and law enforcement. If it all falls on law enforcement, I think we're going we're to have difficulties. So, so you think that you know, there is a scope, as it were, to, to harvest the uh, evidence and, and to, to provide it. OK, Chris Nelson, Police and Crime Commissioner for Gloucestershire, that, you know, the general concern is that fraud is, is not um, perhaps being prosecuted or investigated to the extent that it might be. What's your perspective on all this? Well, I, I think uh, you're right. I, th I think the current system um, is broken. Action fraud doesn't work. Um, it's used like a get out of jail card from Monopoly. So a fraud case comes into a force. Um, it gets sent off to action fraud uh, and we hear very little uh, about it. So we've done our job. Um, it's action fraud's responsibility, but they're completely swamped uh, and they don't do very much uh, at all. So I think the national system is broken. We've got a small unit within the force that, that deals with economic crime and fraud and cyber. Um, it's too small. I, I'm looking to expand it. I want to try and do it cleverly and, and target crimes that will actually uh, generate money from criminal activity to pay for my expansion and make it sort of self-funding, you know, proceeds of crime and, and, and drug uh, activities, uh, trying to get as much money into the... Um, can, I, can I pause that? I mean, it, because people will say Gloucester is a small force. It's probably about 1,400 or 1,600 police officers, something of that Well, order. the total is about 1,200 officers. Oh, 1,200 officers, okay. And, and so... Um, 
Is there an argument for, for saying that although you've got the NCA, the FCO, sorry, the FCA, the SFO nationally, but in terms of what might be lower value fraud, but nonetheless very significant for the victims, is there an argument that you should be teaming up with the likes of, I don't know, Wiltshire or South Wales police or police forces in the area so that you can actually bring some critical mass to bear so that when these reports come in, you can actually do something about them? Well, within the Southwest, there's five forces, and uh, you've talked about some of them. We have what's known as the Regional Organised Crime Unit, ROCU, um, and, and they look at more of the serious and organised crime, higher level crime, higher value crime. Mm. But, you know, you alluded to earlier the scale mm. of, of crime. Crime has changed fundamentally over the last 10 years, and fraud, crimes and scams are happening everywhere. And we've really not got a clue how much it's going on because when people get scammed, they're, they're so embarrassed about it. Um, they often don't talk about it. it. Certainly businesses keep it uh, quiet. So there's lots of stuff going on of a huge range in value. Um, the national level, uh, the, the, the big serious and organised crimes are being dealt with, NCA and, and, and so forth. Rocco will, Rocco will deal with middle um, value activity, but there's still a great deal of activity fraud. Courier frauds, for instance, mm. we're regularly targeted from people in London um, who target older people, and when they find an older person and they have a successful scam, they pass that information to other organised criminals who then target that individual time after time after time. So we in Gloucestershire have to do something about it. Can I pick up two points that have just arisen here? So uh, what, two potential issues. One, do you think if there was uh, better data sharing, in other words, um, not only does the complainant come along and make a report, I've been the victim of crime, but actually you get a whole dump of stuff from HMRC who say this supports the allegation. Would that, do you think that that would empower local police forces to frankly go around and fill some collars and get people arrested? Do, do you find that you're in a situation all too often where a complainant comes and says, I've been defrauded, and you sit there and go, well, if we're starting from ground zero in terms of investigating that whole thing, it makes it just too big of a task. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this, the, the discussion that we've had so far has been very interesting, um, but it's not just about legislation and, and culture and being risk averse or not being risk averse. It's also about IT, the sophistication of your IT and how you can transfer things, the automation side of things. Have you got a box of tricks? That but, just it, but, you need, but ultimately you need evidence. I mean, what puts people behind bars is, is evidence. But it's the collection of yeah. that, how easy it is to collect it, where do you go? And if a task is hugely time intensive, whether it's because you can't get the evidence or, or you can't transfer the evidence for legal reasons, or your IT doesn't readily access other sources of evidence um, that if you could bring together, you'd realize other sources of information, which if you could bring together become evidence. Um, and it's also a personnel thing, how big your team is to press the buttons and do activity. So it's a multiplicity okay. of issues. I'm just going to ask, um, just pick up the point then that Dr. Brimblecombe made, you know, this, is there a, do you detect a kind of cultural reticence or, or even fear about data sharing because the police fear that they're going to be hauled up Everywhere. with the ICO? Absolutely everywhere. I come across it almost on a daily basis. You talked about preparation of files and, and what gets sent from our force to the CPS, the level of redaction, who's responsible for the redaction. You know, the police are told to redact everything. That takes ages. Um, the file takes ages being prepared. And, and, and meanwhile, uh, that the witnesses, the victims become distraught, they get fed up and they drop out of the legal process. So that sort of risk averseness goes on all over the place. This week, I had a member of the public who sat on our independent stop and search mm -hmm. panel and they'd left uh, the panel because they were fed up about the confidentiality agreements that the force had introduced mm -hmm. uh, to protect GDPR, personal data of people who are being stopped and searched in the, in the meeting and then this member going back to social media and then sharing everything. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's a bit of an issue.
and, and we were using a confidentiality agreement that was used across the forces and was a little bit too generic, a little bit too all-encompassing. Mm. And, you know, I said at the end, we must refocus that agreement. Just do the minimum yeah. amount well, necessary. You've got, to, you've got to comply with the law, but, but don't, but gold don't plating. go over the so, top. So is there gold plating going on? Are people seeing ghosts, particularly police forces? You know, there's this, there's this monster over the hill, which is the ICO that is going to come and uh, raise hell. Um, so it, it, I think you indicated that is a bit of an issue. Would you confirm that? And also, what, you know, what's, the, what's the answer? Is it just better education, training? What's the solution? It's better education and training. It's both of those things. I think there's definitely, as you say, a fear of sort of ghosts that aren't there. And I think that's through a lack of understanding because there are lots of complex sort of legal instruments here in dif different levels, as I said earlier. And I just think more guidance from sort of the top echelons, like parliamentary, governmental, the ICO possibly again, and I think that the more information that's out there and that's easily accessible, it's easy to read it. So, for example, when I wrote my part of the briefing paper that we've all read, you know, I'm doing it from a legal background. I've been studying this for 10 years. I was thinking in my mind, how easy would these, even these just two pieces of legislation, so the UK GDPR and the GPA, be? How, could, how easy would it be for a sort of a company um, to actually navigate that? I think quite isn't difficult. There a, isn't there a duty on the ICO to make it more user-friendly? Why, why shouldn't, shouldn't they be coming out and saying, in these circumstances, this is what will put you on the right side of the line, and this is what will put you on the wrong side of the line. Because you know, we in government, uh, as I say, stepped in to try to provide the police uh, with guidance in respect to provide, sending files uh, from the police to the CPS to make their life easier. But the authority of the ICO would be helpful, wouldn't it? The ICO does a lot. So um, when I wrote the briefing paper, you'll see a lot of my citations on my section where from the ICO's yeah. guidance. I think you know, there's an argument there needs to be more I think that would be helpful because it went so, so far and no further. And it needs to be promulgated. People need to read this stuff. It's one thing producing yes. it, but it's other thing, another thing people reading it, right? Yes, and I wonder how much of that is going on um, because I had to sort of spend quite a while actually looking at multiple different sources to actually build a whole picture. And I wonder if there needs to be some guidance either at parliamentary or government level or from the ICO that puts everything together in one one-stop shop easy place to read and that because we're talking about issues of clarity that would add clarity and they're also and it's not just information it's worked examples mm. because it's fair enough having you know all, all the law laid out but often um you have to give people worked examples which is what we did in our yeah. guidance, in my uh, in the attorney general's guidance. to really turn it yeah. into something practical exactly. and informative, and takes away the questions because yeah. you oh well, I, well we, we we're not doing that. Examples of, <clears throat> if you're a police officer, you turn up, you've got your body worn camera. This is what you observe. Do you need to redact in those circumstances? And it was a step by step guide. You speak to your senior officer because you know without sort of getting straying too much off topic, one of the most valuable pieces of legislation, which I think probably you and I would agree, is the Police and Criminal Evidence yeah. Act from 1984. It's an ancient piece of legislation, really. But it provided these codes of practice to police officers. This is what you do in these circumstances. This is when you give uh, a, a suspect a break. This is when you uh, offer them legal advice. And I think, similarly, people, people broadly want to do the right thing. Um, they just don't want to have to read a manual uh, uh, but before to, to try to work it out. And, of course, if it's not clear, they will be defensive, or they risk uh, being risk, risk being defensive. And this is why we're here. I mean, that, that that's the, the whole principle behind getting together academia practitioners and, and technologists such as our business, was we wanted to be actually bring a bit of awareness to this, because in our experience, the ICO are fantastic. You can write questions to them, you can give them examples, and usually within a matter of days, they'll respond and give you pretty definitive guidance. And that can be whether you're a public authority, or a government organisation, or a private entity, and, and we've helped a number of our clients do exactly that so as to get clarity around this. I think practitioners, investigators, analysts, everybody wants this information to be shared. Yeah. And the, the, the point we're trying to get across, I, I think from all of us, is that the legislation is there. It, perhaps it's not as clear as it could be, but, but we're in a position now where government organisations, police forces can and should be sharing within the appropriate yeah. circumstances. Can I, can I ask a point about, and I think it might be interesting if the others come in on this, uh, the business about automation. Is there a role for saying that more information should be automatically shared. So you were talking about HMRC uh, sometimes being reluctant to share stuff. So is there an argument for saying that, that actually uh, if somebody assesses that a crime has taken place and they've ticked that box which says that's their human assessment because it can't all be done by a machine, that in those circumstances there should be a, a trigger cascade that that material then 
gets provided to it? And then the next question is to who? Um, <clears throat> so I think automatic exchange could potentially be incredibly helpful. So we saw this um, in terms of efforts to combat offshore tax evasion. So for a long time, countries were exchanging tax related information on request. So um, say the UK thought a, a certain taxpayer had an offshore account um, in a certain jurisdiction, um, HMRC would request information from that particular country. However, that was um, a very difficult system. It was very slow. Often the countries would refuse. They would base that on exceptions within the treaties. And so because of that, we saw uh, the common reporting standard being brought in, which provides for the automatic exchange of tax related information between countries. So that now means that HMRC has a repository of information. If they want to investigate a particular person, that information is there for them to look at. Um, and that's led to huge um, huge successes in terms of the collection of revenue um, and almost every developed uh, country has signed up to that system. So perhaps replicating some of those benefits on a national level could be really advantageous. Um, for instance, a few years ago there was a proposal to create a central bank account portal in the UK. Um, which ultimately I think it was decided it would be sort of too expensive, too time consuming to introduce. Um, but there are, given sort of the gains that we've made offshore from that automatic exchange system, there are questions raised as to whether it would be worth that initial investment. Now, I know um, Fiona might come at this from a very different angle than I might, because one of the big concerns with the automatic exchange of information between countries has been privacy and data protection, because obviously then you're not considering the things that Fiona mentioned earlier in terms of is it necessary, is it proportional, etc., because you're just sending all information in one go. So there are challenges there, I think, um, mm -hmm. in terms of that angle. Yeah. Alex Chalks had to dash off um, to deal with lots of very important um, matters, um, sends his apologies and uh, will carry on in his absence. But um, um, Chris, I, I wonder whether you could um, just pick up on a couple of points that were raised and give some context around uh, data sharing and consequences within the vetting scenario, because I know that that's something that's been particularly poignant within your force of late. Yeah, I mean, we're doing lots of uh, recruiting. We've got the 20,000 uh, national uplift of officers, which for Gloucestershire uh, represents about 150. So that's about 50 each year, although this year, um, the third year of, of the scheme, it's actually about 60. Um, and that's on top of all the retirements that take place. We, we lose, say... Um, 10, 11 um, a month, so 120 plus 60, 180 this year um, of, of officers. There's also the police staff. Um, so there's lots of churn, lots of activity. Um, there's only so many people in the vetting um, office and the delays never cease to uh, amaze me. It takes months and months and months to get people vetted. And it's not just the new people coming in. You know, if you transfer from another force or if you transfer from one job to another job within the force, often you have to be re-vetted. Um, I can see why the, the dangers, you want to minimise the risks, but it really does restrain your, your choice and flexibility as to how you manage the day-to-day -day life. And, and modern management, modern um, law and order issues, people want decisions now, want results now. Um, and vetting definitely slows up the whole process. So if I had a magic system that could automate it and do it really quickly, I'm interested. Well, I wonder where on earth you'd find one of those. Um, but um, obviously, we know fr fr from experience about these issues, whether it's cabinet office vetting or inquiries to do with non-police personnel or police personnel, we've got these huge backlogs. And in a world where cases like Wayne Cousins or Jake Davidson down in Plymouth and the shooting, this is a, a fundamental um, issue that needs to be resolved as quickly as possible. We need to ensure that people in positions of responsibility um, 
are behaving appropriately and anything that can be done to assist law enforcement agencies, police forces with that um, plainly needs to be done. And I guess it's not just speeding up. Um, I guess if, if it can improve the quality of the vetting and speed it up, then um, it would be a win-win. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll keep doing our best. Um, so, so in terms of the case studies that we discussed, we, we touched upon Karam Butt earlier on. And um, I just, just one issue that I, I know you're aware of, Nick, that I wanted to come back on. But we know from experience that actually there were a number of investigations into uh, Karam Butt independent of the banking sector, in fact, in the insurance space, where he was believed to have been involved in cash for crash schemes to, to finance his sell. And there was a whole host of information that these insurance investigators were aware of that wasn't imparted to, to government bodies and the like. But I, I think we could all agree now, the legislation exists so that it could have been imparted to them quite readily. And, and obviously those atrocities ensued. And I just wondered from your perspective whether you could give us a bit more of an insight into, the, into that wider case of Karam Butt uh, and whether you could give us a bit more of an input into perhaps how that, if, if we could look back in time now, how that could have been better dealt with, what legislation would have applied and, and, and what impact that might have had. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's intriguing about the carrying butt instance is that you, you've, you've got a classic example of um, investigations for fraud not being used as a disruptive mechanism to it, and hindsight a wonderful thing, of course. Um, but what we've been able to ascertain from looking at the evidence provided in, in America, for example, is that there are figures vary between 17 to roughly 21% of all US terrorism convictions are for fraud. So it shows that by actively investigating, obviously, you know, the, the American fraud system is over 150 years old in terms of criminalizing fraud at the, in the Civil War, the Mail Fraud Act and the Wire Fraud Act. So they have a much more robust coordinated uh, response to, to looking at fraud. So you could use that, and I think uh, has, um, after the 7th of July attack in London, uh, the official investigation of the parliamentary, it's a parliamentary inquiry, um, operatives from various government agencies admitted that we could have looked more into the, the petty theft, the petty fraud committed by the, the four terrorists to partly finance that attack in 2005. But to, to me, um, in terms of, of the legislation, um, there, there, there needed to be a mandatory reporting system for fraud. Um, I appreciate that the, the other side against that would be higher compliance costs. And, and you could argue that the economic crime levy could partly finance that. And then there's, there's an argument that maybe a percentage of fines received by the Financial Conduct Authority, there were billions every year, that could partly be used to offset any costs onto the sector. But for me, that if you've got the insurance uh, sector, you've got the banking sector, both submitting a, a type of report to a central agency that ticks the red flags. And the other intriguing point is that, um, according to the coroner's inquiry evidence into carrying but he'd also successfully applied for online loans with £14,000, which is how the San Bernardino attack in California was financed in 2017, where the husband and wife terrorists had obtained a loan with $26,000 which they then used to buy the, the, the extensive armaments and munitions and, and automatic weapons for that terrorist attack. So for me, it's about having, I suppose, one, you know, if you're looking for blue sky thinking, having one entity that looks at all financial intelligence because you've got the FCA do it, action, fraud, CIFAS, everyone is working in, 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 in what appears to be silo. But I suppose, you know, I think it's what we said in, in the, the briefing paper, Sam, there needs to be a central body to streamline the process. And you know, I, I don't think we will revisit the, the, the proposal by the government in 2010 about an economic crime agency, a single entity, because you know, the SFO began to flex their muscles, the FCA began to flex their muscles in terms of more fines, more DPAs in terms of raising awareness. But ultimately, it's about, I think, that single entity that looks at all financial intelligence, whether fraud, money laundering, terrorism, financing, market abuse, and that agency needs to be financed properly. So I think that that's probably, if, uh, uh, my recommendations were mandatory reporting for fraud. Uh, that might not go down well with a lot of people, and I understand that, but there needs to be a single entity, a bit like the US model for FinCEN, where everything goes to FinCEN. I certainly think we need to treat it more seriously. We've talked about the, whole, the huge volume of, of fraud that's going on out there. And just listening to you, um, I, I think about gateway 
mm. crimes. I'm coming, you know, low-level antisocial behaviour. If it's left um, to fester, it can become quite violent, quite serious, and in extreme cases, um, murder. Now, in fraud, the, all of these fraud cases, and if we just let people do that, I think over time, someone who, who fraudulently gets £10,000 or whatever thinks, oh, that was easy, uh, I'll upscale and go to 100000 etc., etc., etc. And given the scale of what's going on out there, there must be all sorts of gateway activity where low-level fraud can then become quite serious criminal activity Absol and terrorist Absolutely, and and you know what what, what we found in, in terms of uh, another study that we've been working with, with Synology on is that sort of this fraud dossier is that you know ISIS and Al Qaeda will have an online cookbook of easy scams to commit fraud, and mm. because it's low level crime, uh, because of if it's lack of resources, lack of intelligence within police forces, it's they're not going to investigate. So it, it, it's, easy it's, money. And of course, that the, the acts of terrorism are committed by low capability weapons. Mm. So if you combine that together you sadly have a perfect scenario where low-level crime might not be invested with police for whatever reasons, that it might not be reported by the individual, but that can then fund an act of terrorism. And if you look at, in terms of how 9-11 was financed, a large part of that was passport fraud, immigration fraud, identity mm. theft, bank fraud. So it's, it's a catalyst for, as you, as you correctly mentioned, what could become another attack it's, on that it's, it's a bit of a ticking time bomb. Yeah. Well, this has been coming for some time. I mean, one of the reasons why we're, we're doing this today in conjunction with the Southwest Fraud Forum is because we want to bring greater attention and awareness. And within your, your paper, uh, you report globally fraud losses account for approximately 6% of the global GDP. It totals £3.89 trillion and £130 billion in the UK. Uh, these figures are just startling. Mm. And, and when, if we somebody... well, when we talk about things like the cost of living crisis uh, and all the issues that uh, need funding in our communities if we could only access and stop a lot of that activity we would have a lot of money to to service public services precisely and that's why forces such as the gloucestershire police force which is just refreshing to hear that you're investing in your economic crime teams and and your proceeds of crime act recovery knowing that actually every pound that gets brought back actually goes back into central government pot and partly into the, your policing fund for your, your area. And so forces that can invest in and, and ensure that recovery from criminals who have been convicted of fraud lose their assets must be of paramount importance. Because with these figures, um, if we don't stop it, further acts of atrocity are going to be financed by and these think, crimes. And this is where Sam might come in. I think you know, from, we've written another paper on, on sort of corruption and tax crime. And I think, I can't remember the exact figure in terms of how much money has been unclaimed from asset recovery. It's worth billions. So you've got, oh, sorry, if you want to, you know. No, I completely agree with you. I think one of the issues there, though, is, um, I suppose we're lawyers, so we always go back to the law, but in terms of the amounts that are that they try to recover from these criminals are often quite inflated so the criminals won't actually have the assets that they try to recover um, which means that there's a lot of debt in the system um, and money that's just been written off that we can't actually recover from them um, but I think asset recovery is definitely a way forward and like you say if um, law enforcement authorities police um, authorities actually spent more time on addressing economic crime, they could get a percentage of that back through the asset recovery incentivization scheme. Have you got any recommendations yeah. for me? <laughs> I think um, it's perhaps just knowing about it and making more use of it. Um, I was surprised to find in my research that the largest single agency to use the asset recovery mechanisms is actually HMRC. Um, so they use it way more than the NCA, the SFO, the FCA, um, which perhaps just suggests that maybe there needs to be more awareness and more of an attempt to actually go after asset recovery to enforce those orders and then to benefit from the monies that have been yeah, recovered. It's, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because um, it's one of the few pieces of legislation that when, when debated in Parliament, it was deliberately described as draconian. Mm. 
it was meant to be. It's one of the few pieces of legislation that when you're prosecuting a case, if you, in, if you invite a judge to set down a timetable for proceeds of crime recovery, they have no discretion in terms of whether that happens. That must happen. Of course, it's up to judicial discretion what orders are made, but that process must then follow. What, what amount of money has this person benefited from and what is the available amount that ensues? And I think that it's really important that there's clarity around the fact that high figures for benefit from criminality are very different from the orders that judges make on the available amount. So a judge has done the financial investigation into what does person A who's convicted of fraud actually have? His car, his house, links to these other matters. And, and it's those figures for available amount where we're seeing, and I'm certainly seeing from a lot of prosecutions and a lot of pocket cases that I've done, um, those recoveries are coming through. They're working their way through the pipeline. They are helping fund further police investigations, government inquiries. And I think that the lawyers need to grab hold of these cases a little bit more and ensure that these timetables are set down in the appropriate circumstances, because that's money that we need to be getting back. We need to put a dent into these billions of pounds that have been flying out to criminals. I think a, a lot of lawyers almost see it as something separate, don't they? It's almost... And an add-on that's for someone else, the asset recovery part of it, whereas actually perhaps we need a more sort of integrated way of thinking of actually from beginning to end, including the recovery process. And a police officer will look at it from a threat, risk, harm and think, um, what's the greatest impact on the victim and go after those, those criminals? Um, the, 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 the trouble is, from, from, from my point of view, I'm trying to scratch my head and trying to figure out how can I expand my economic crime unit? So what crimes should I go after that will give more money back into the force so I can expand the size of my economic crime unit so we can go after the greatest threat? Um, crimes. Um, so it's quite a difficult um, game to play and to get right. Um, so I'm often asking questions about this. I'm biased. Anything under the Fraud Act, straight away. <laughs> I was going to say Nick may have given you your answer with fraud. I think fraud and tax evasion are probably the two of the most prevalent crimes apart from money laundering, which often catches yeah. everything. I, I... Um, I think so. I think Sam is right. Money laundering is, is the headline figure. That's what the press like to be involved. There's a massive scandal with X company, Y company. But ultimately, fraud is just, um, you know, I think I use a very bad analogy that it's like a distant cousin that comes to a wedding no one talks to. Fraud is the threat. It is a national security threat. You know, there are multiple cases, sadly, where terrorists have been financed by fraud. And we've seen the atrocities in the last 15 to 20 years. So until there is a, a, a clear direction from central government of this is our fraud strategy, this is what the aims and objectives are, this is the funding to support that, I still think that we are a little bit, which way's the wind blowing? Well, the, the technology exists, the will's there, People on the ground, from an investigation perspective, want to see this achieved. We've heard from Alex Chalk, MP, QC, today that government want to achieve these ends and our police and crime commissioner is obviously very keen to ensure that that's done as well. So uh, from, from my perspective, I, 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 I think it's probably an appropriate point there to wrap up on everything we've said. I'm so grateful for all of you taking the time to write your fantastic briefing paper and for us to have this exposure to be able to debate this and hopefully get a bit of attention to these issues, which is long overdue. I think we can all agree on. So thank you very much. And I hope if this hasn't been too painful, we can do it again sometime. <laughs>